Please stand as you are able and turn to face the processional cross. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to All Saints Lutheran Church on this third Sunday after the Epiphany. I am Pastor Chris, and it's great to have you here with us to worship. And also those who are joining us online, thank you for joining us on this day. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me
beloved of God, called to be saints, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. peace throughout the world for the unity of all let us pray to the lord us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The book Jonah is a comedy starring a reluctant prophet who is a given, who has given a one-sentence message. Nineveh will be destroyed in 40 days. Much to Jonah's dismay, the people of Nineveh repent. The point of the story is to give the reader to wrestle with the one question, on whom shall God have mercy? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, <coughs> going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, 
and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading from 1 Corinthians. Paul does not approve, disapprove of marriage or other human social institutions. He does, however, want Christians to live in the present in fervent anticipation of God's future, which even now has dawned through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as those they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks At this time, I invite forward all my young friends for the children's sermon. <coughs> all right, good morning, everyone. How's everybody today? All right, you slept well, even though it's kind of cold outside? Yeah, okay. So I have a question for you. Have you ever gone fishing before? A, a couple of you? You have? I went fishing. You went fishing? Okay. I went ice fishing. Ice fishing, really? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when you're up in Minnesota, okay. Yeah, I don't think we can do much ice fishing down in South Carolina, can we? Yeah. Well, fishing is a lot of fun, and even if you haven't gone, I think you probably know a little bit about it. What are some of the things you need if you're going to go fishing? Yes. A fishing pole. A fishing pole. Okay. Yeah. Some kind of bait. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you keep them in the beginning of the fish. You clean it and then wash them at the house. 
Yeah, you wash them. Call it cleaning them. And then you, um, you don't have to get into the details of what we do after we clean them. <laughs> you did cook, okay. A bucket, yeah, a bucket. And, and then, so you have the fishing pole, and well, well, there's a line on there, but how did the fish get onto that line? What's at the end of the line? A hook, a hook, okay. So I think you all know what you're talking about with fishing, and that's good. But back, we're about to read a story about some fishermen and Jesus meeting them. And they're not just standing on the side of the lake with, uh, with fishing rods. Uh, they're out in the middle of the lake on the boat. But even out there, guess what? They don't have their poles or anything like that. They don't even have hooks. How are they fishing without hooks and poles? Um, they're grabbing their hands. With their hands? Oh, yeah. Well, here's a picture I just want to show you. So back then, uh, they had these big nets, and they would, they would pull, they'd put the nets down in the water, and then they'd lift them up, and a bunch of fish would be in there. Let's see if the next page has a picture. Let's see. Do we have any? I should have made sure. But anyway, they caught a lot of fish that way with these nets. But have you all ever been down to Shem Creek before and seen, like, the shrimp boats down there? Yeah. Do the shrimp boats have large nets on them? Yeah, and they catch shrimp with them. And so it's kind of like that, that they, they use these large nets that they went out into the middle of the water and they, they threw out the nets and they brought in all, this, all these fish. And so there's on the back picture, you can see all the fish in the boat. And so that's how they did fishing back then. And Jesus tells these fishermen in the story, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Now, does, yeah, fish for people? That's my thought exactly, yeah. Because are, are there people down there in the water that they're going to pull up with the net? No, it doesn't make sense. But what, what he's talking about is that if you follow Jesus, then that they will learn to tell people about God's love and God's care, and that uh, people will want to hear that news. And so they'll come in and they'll, they'll follow Jesus too. And so when you hear that phrase like uh, that Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fish for people, uh, he's talking about that you'll be able to go out and tell people about God's love and that they'll like to hear that. So that's something he says to those first disciples, but we today, we still do that. We don't go out with nets or anything, but we, we try to live God's love and care and that people, others can see that in our lives and that they can uh, know about God's love through us. All right, will you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. He taught people to fish for me taught people to fish for me. And he teaches me how to fish for others. Teaches me how to fish for others. Help me to show love and care always. Help me to show love and care always. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you all so much for joining me. You can go back to your seats now. Before Jesus calls his first disciples, he proclaims a message that, comes known, that becomes known as the gospel or good news from God. God is ready to rule our lives. Those who realize this will respond with repentance and faith. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed through the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated.
Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When I was a young child, my grandparents always took me fishing with my older brother. In all likelihood, for the longest time, I probably didn't like it very much. I remember thinking that the worms were just slimy little creatures that enjoyed wiggling through my fingers as I tried to hook them. I also was not able to cast my line very well. I know that because I fully recall the horror I felt that one time when my hook didn't land in the body of water that was in front of me, and instead it went backwards and embedded into my grandmother's scalp. <laughs> I remember that there were some side cutters that were involved in the extraction, and ultimately she was fine. <laughs> I recall that I was always disappointed that my grandparents and my older brother were the ones who always caught a fish, but I never did. And one day, though, I finally caught one, and my grandparents took a picture of me with this fish, and I still have it. <laughs> <laughs> The day was a few months shy of my fourth birthday, and in the photo I'm wearing a Masters of the Universe hat and a straight from the 80s vest. However, there is one more thing that I'm definitely wearing in this picture, and it is the biggest grin that a little boy can muster. <laughs> I was hooked, you could say. <laughs> Although I had been reluctant about fishing prior to that day, you can tell by this picture that things have changed. Reluctance is nothing new to any of us. As long as there have been people, those people have been reluctant to do various things. Some of you may have been reluctant this morning to venture out of your warm beds and make your way here, but I get it, I get it. <laughs> An example of another reluctant person is Jonah. His story plays out over four chapters, and those few pages have earned him the moniker of the reluctant prophet. Jonah doesn't want to follow God's instructions to go to Nineveh to warn them about their sins, so he flees in the opposite direction. And as he is trying to get out of what he's supposed to do, the story goes that he is swallowed by a great fish, and three days later he's dropped off at Nineveh, which is the capital of the enemy Assyrian Empire. Jonah is so reluctant to be the prophetic voice for these people that he actually shortchanges the message. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. His total prophetic message is eight words. <laughs> eight words. <laughs> Imagine if I got up here and preached and just an eight-word sermon. Granted, some of you might welcome that. <laughs> However, many of you would think that I was shirking my duties. What, which is exactly what Jonah was doing. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's all he said. And notice that he doesn't even reference God in his eight-word proclamation. Jonah was doing the absolute least that he could do. From the beginning of the story to the very end, Jonah was reluctant, and he was never pleased with being a prophet. If he, gave this, if he gave this kind of effort in a sport, he would be cut from the team. And what resulted from Jonah's uninspiring proclamation? The whole city repented, we're told, and God has mercy on them. Is this story a testament of Jonah's great work? Of course not. <laughs> Ultimately, the story is meant to ask the reader, you and I, whether we can accept God showing mercy to people who you and I may despise. Perhaps people who've hurt us. Perhaps people that we disapprove of. If God shows mercy to them, what will we do about it? Will we throw a tantrum like Jonah and cry out that it would be better for us to die? Or will we come to the conclusion that you and I need grace just like everybody else and that God's abundance of grace should reshape our lives? The story of Jonah is also a testament that God is greater than Jonah's reluctance. If Jonah is fleeing that way, well, then God's going to make him go this way. If Jonah begrudgingly proclaims 
eight measly words to Nineveh, well then, God is going to use those eight words to do an amazing thing in the hearts of the Ninevites. God can work with reluctant people. In fact, he does some of his best work with reluctant people. Moses, reluctant. Esther, reluctant. Isaiah, reluctant. The list certainly goes on. It goes on because God has a tendency to do the divine work of drawing people in, even when people are reluctant to go along with it. To see this, we need to look no further than our gospel lesson. Jesus sees Simon and Andrew casting their net out into the sea. I'm not sure why they immediately followed him, but if they had any hesitancy, Jesus somehow broke through it. Jesus hollers at them and says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And that's the imagery that Jesus uses, first uses to describe the work of his father's kingdom, fish in a net. Have you ever seen fish that are caught in a fishing net? I haven't spoken to many of them, but it appears to me that many of those fish are reluctant to be in that net. It appears to me that the more that they are drawn in, the more they tend to fervently struggle against that. The Gospel of John uses the same image of God using the net to go fishing. In John, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him in. It's the language of pulling someone closer in with a rope or a net. God is fishing for people. And some people are going to be very reluctant to be caught up in God's fishing net. And maybe they are reluctant because they are struggling with the idea of God actually caring for them. Or maybe it's because the last thing they want to do is share this net with someone who has hurt them in the past. Or maybe they are reluctant because God's net seems to be so big that they don't like the idea that the catch may include some of the people that they deem unfavorable. We can come up with any number of reasons why people are reluctant to be drawn toward God in his net. But that isn't the point. The point is that the pull of God's net is greater than our reluctance. It is good news that God can handle our human weaknesses and our struggles. It is good news that God can handle our fears and our doubts. It is good news that God can handle it whenever we struggle against his net of grace. Even when we are like Jonah, reluctant to accept the call that God has given us, it is good news that God can still do some amazing work through people like us. Why would God be so ready to draw in a net full of people with who there's, excuse me, why would God be so ready to draw in a net full of people with begrudging attitudes and who struggle to get away? Why would God want to work through people who can be stubbornly reluctant to live in God's net of grace? Why is a hard question to answer, but I have a clue here. I look at this picture, and I see the joy that is all over the face of this kid. <laughs> It's only one tiny, meager little fish that I caught. But I see the joy on that face, and I think of the rejoicing that must take place in heaven when the bounty of God's catch is revealed, as God pulls in that net of grace that surrounds each and every one of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please kneel or sit as you can. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. God, our rock and deliverance, do not let your church be shaken. We trust you never abandon your promises to the most vulnerable among us. Give your church wisdom and empathy in its various ministries. God of grace, receive our prayer. God, our hope and refuge, you placed fish in the sea. Guide our care of, the, of oceans and all creatures that live in them. Hold us accountable for actions that endanger water sources and the people who depend on them. God of grace, receive our prayer. God, who proclaims judgment and offers mercy, be a model to the leaders of our nation and world. As they lead, may they follow in your way of justice and truth. God of grace, Please receive our prayer. God, who cares for the suffering, care for survivors of assault and sex, sexual abuse, and sustain all who minister to them. Bless the work of my sister's house, Charleston. Keep safe anyone who live under threat of violence, those living in poverty, and any among us who are ill or in pain, especially Bill, Tina, Tina. Asta, Asta. Grace. Grace, Stephen, Stephen. Chuck, Chuck. Don, Don. Eunice. Eunice, Pamela, Pamela. Kruger, Kruger. June. June, and those we name before you. God of resurrection and new life, as the first disciples shared the good news, empower our All Saints Faith community to be open to your call. When we are uncertain of your call, assure us. When we have strayed from your ways, redirect us. God of grace, our prayer. the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share with one another a sign of God's peace.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Thanks, Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who you sent at this end of the ages to save and redeem us and to proclaim us, proclaim to us your will. He is your word, inseparable from you, through whom you created all things and in whom you take delight. He is your word, sent from heaven to a virgin's womb. He there took on our nature and our lot and was shown forth as your Son, born of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary. He, our Lord Jesus, fulfilled all your will and won for you a holy people. He stretched out his hand in suffering in order to free from suffering those who trust you. He is the one handed over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death, to break the bonds of the evil one, to crush hell underfoot, to give light to the righteous, to establish his covenant, and to show forth the resurrection. Taking bread and giving thanks to you said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink. This, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and resurrection, we take this bread and cup, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve you as your priestly people. Send your spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith in truth that we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At Jesus' table, heaven and earth are joined as one. Come and see. Thanks be to God.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. You may be seated for a few announcements. <clears throat> Next week will be our annual congregational meeting, so we will have one single combined 10 a.m. service, followed by the meeting. So 10 o'clock next week, no 8.30. And we'll have a short break, continue with the meeting, and then we will go on to the Parish Life Center for our potluck lunch. So think about what you might want to bring um, as a side, to, I mean, a, uh, a dish to share, and we'll all sit down and enjoy some fellowship after the uh, meeting. And there'll be more information about that in the parish notes and the e-news if you would like to read that. Hopefully you got your packet. If anybody did not get the packet for the uh, meeting, just let us know, and we'll make sure you get that electronically or on paper. Also, don't forget that next Friday is uh, the congregational game night. This should be just an easy, relaxed way to come and kind of get to know some people outside of Sunday morning. So we would love to see a bunch of you there as we play games and eat pizza and just enjoy one another's fellowship at um, 5 p.m. on Friday. And finally, I want to highlight, um, we are hosting a benefit concert. This is kind of in lieu of just launching a campaign with Temple Talks and uh, bulletin inserts, we thought this would be more fun. And we have this wonderful um, artist in our midst, Peggy Roberts, who also works for the Lutheran Retreat Centers, which is the organization that will be benefiting. So we would invite you all to come out on Sunday, February 4th at 5 p.m. And if you do, you might even see Pastor Chris on the program, so just a little enticement. Um, we're going to dress up the Parish Life Center a little bit, and if you want to dress up too and bring your sweetheart for a Valentine's date, that would be great as well. So that's 5 p.m. on Saturday, February 4th. Tickets can be found online on our website or in the office. At this time, I invite you to stand for your sending blessing and hymn. God who names you, Christ who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. You are God's beloved. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. That's okay.